The night was cold, raindrops scattered across the road like tiny pellets, the flash of red and blue emergency lights reflected off the wet pavement and the wreckage of a crashed sedan against a broken tree. Come on, kid. Stay with me. Stay with me. Jack the EMT whispered. Drops of rain rolled off his face while he pumped his hands against the ribcage of a teenaged boy. Clear, his partner, Dave, yelled. Jack raised his arms as Dave charged an electric current into the boy's heart. The boy's body jerked on the wet gravel road. Jack started pumping the kid's chest again. Come on, kid, come back to us. Still no pulse, Jack. It's been too long. We ought to call it. Once more. Come on, kid. Again, they tried to revive the boy, but to no avail. Dang it. Jack sat back, wiped rain and sweat off his nose with his wrist. Call it. After a moment of regret, Jack covered the kid with a tarp. He stood up, gave himself a minute. It, it was always painful to lose someone so young. He heard a rock skitter across the ground. Jack swiveled his head toward the black brush from behind the tree. Was someone there? Maybe an animal? He couldn't see anything through the curtain of rain. He rolled his shoulders, picked up a medical bag, and turned away. Let's pack up and get the coroner here. Kid didn't make it. Officer Manor asked him on his way back to the ambulance. Jack shook his head. Not this time. Too bad. This road is dangerous, let alone during a storm like this. Don't I know it with the calls I've had here in the past? Jack trailed off as he placed his bag into the van. Officer Manor nudged his flashlight toward the dark. And right here, near a cemetery of all places. Bad vibes, I think. Just a coincidence. Jack said. A sudden movement caught his eye. Jack squinted it against the rain and shifted his attention toward the body. There was a dark form in the rain. Was someone leaning over the corpse? For a split second, the hairs on the back of his neck raised. Then he shook the feeling off. He blinked to make sure his eyes weren't playing tricks on him. There was someone. Short, slim, frail. The form ho hovered over the dead boy's body, doing some kind of motion with its hands, back and forth. Then he saw it. A knife. Jack stepped forward. Hey, get away from him! The dark form jumped up, long wet hair covering a face, light glistening off the weapon and something swinging from the figure's hand. Then the little thing ran away, back into the darkness of the brush. What happened, Jack? Officer Manor asked, scanning the darkness. Jack pointed toward the dark brush. I saw someone, leaning over the body. It, uh, it was an, another kid, I think. Maybe a girl. Officer Manu walked forward, or walked around, sorry, shifting his flashlight around the scene. He came back with a slight twist on his lips. You sure about that, Jack? A young kid walking around in this? How long's your shift been? Jack shrugged a shoulder. Going on 24. Yeah, I need some sleep. Maybe I shouldn't have mentioned the cemetery. Got you thinking of spooks in the night. I was only kidding around, you know. Jack went back to the kid's body and picked up the last medical bag. Maybe he was imagining things. The tarp moved. Jack jumped. Holy heck, Dave. We got a live one. What? The kid. He moved. Get the gurney. You sure? Just get over here. Jack tore the tarp from the body. He saw the kid's face smeared with blood, watched as the ki kid coughed, sucked in air. The kid moaned, help. <laughs> that was a really bad help. Uh, Jack whipped out the portable oxygen and slipped the air mask over the boy's mouth. It's okay, kid. Breathe. We've got you. Nice and easy. You've been in an accident. We're taking you to the hospital and they're going to take good care of you. Do you remember the accident? The boy gave a slight nod. Driving a little too fast in the rain. Wrapped around the tree pretty good. Hang in there, kid. You've just been gifted a miracle. Huh, wait, so the, the girl saved him? That's weird. Jessica pushed the wet mop across the hospital floor to and fro, to and fro. She remembered that saying from somewhere before. She just didn't remember from where. Something from the past. A shudder ran through her as her hands trembled on the stick of the mop. She tightened her grip so it would stop. She felt the hospital staff walk by her. She felt them look at her. She tilted her head forward so her thick black hair curtained her face as much as possible. Not to be seen, not to be noticed, 
No one said anything to her more than necessary. She did not speak to them unless spoken to. She performed her job each day after school and mopped the floors of the children's medical wing. She grew accustomed to the scent of sanitising cleaner and the dismal odour of the sick. She listened to the murmurs of the staff. She paid attention to the beeps of medical machines hooked up to sick children. She studied the various footsteps she heard on the hard tiled floors. Sometimes soft steps, sometimes clicks of heels or stomps of bigger people. Sometimes the steps were rushed, sometimes they were slow. She was aware of each and every child in the hospital wing. She often heard crying and whispers of conversation as she cleaned the floors. The doctor says you're doing really well, Brian. You're eating better. Treatment is going well. That's wonderful, son. A woman's voice spoke from the patient's room that Jessica was near. Yeah, I guess so, Brian murmured. Hang on there, sport. You'll be better before you know it, the man said. And then you'll get to come home and rest in your own bed. I have been feeling a little bit hungrier. That's so good to hear, the woman said. When will I get to go home? I hope soon, son, the man said. When you do, we'll get your favourite pizza from Freddy's Mega Pizza Plex. <laughs> That's, this is so weird. This, oh, this feels so weird, but so good. We'll make it a celebration. How does that sound? Pretty good, actually, the boy said. The man laughed. That's my boy. Bri, Bri spoke the woman. What are all these strange flakes on your chest? Huh? Look, Harry, what are these? My gosh, what kind of hospital did we, did we bring him to? I don't know. They look like little bits of silver, the man said. Relax, Jane, I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation. They've been taking good care of him here. You even said so yourself. He even looks better today. I know, but the woman called out of the room. Nurse Macy, please. Can someone come to my son's room? Yes, Mrs. Raymond. Is Brian okay? Nurse Macy asked. Yes, but what is this strange stuff on my son? I don't want him... I don't want anything on him that is going to make him sicker. Hmm. I don't know what that is. The nurse went in and checked Brian's chest and brushed the strange flakes off him. I don't think it's anything serious, Mr. and Mrs. Raymond. I'll have staff sweep it up and get some new blankets. Please, I don't want any cleaner or anything on him that's going to harm his recovery. Yes, Mrs. Raymond, don't worry. We would never let this happen. Jessica pushed the mop slowly across the hallway, to and fro, to and fro. This is really getting me wonder what this has to do with Jessica's past, you know? What, what in the past is like reminding her of the words to and fro? That's so weird. There's something bigger going on here. Like there's something in this hospital that's causing something and Jessica has a history of something. This is all really weird. I love this. She's so strange, that one. A nursing assistant murmured to Nurse Macy as they were, as they were stocking supplies on a medical cart. Hmm, Jessica, you mean? Quiet. Keeps to herself. Never makes any trouble. Nurse Macy shrugged. Nothing wrong with that. Well, she's so frail. <laughs> it's the second time we've had frail in frailty. Looks like a feather could knock her over. Hair always covering her pretty face. He shuddered. Creeps me out the way she lurks around. It's not normal. She's obviously alive, and yet she's not really living. Nurse Macy shook her head. You've been watching too many horror movies, Colin. How do you think people come up with these scary movie ideas? They see things that freak them out and write about them. I'm sure you were at an awkward age at 14. We're not talking about me. Besides, I talked to people. I tried asking her something the other day, and she just looked at me and blinked like I spoke an alien language or something. Nurse Macy sighed. Oh, Colin. Clang. Just then, something dropped from behind them, making them jump. Colin let out a childish eek. <laughs> eek. <laughs> uh, Nurse Macy glanced down to see a rusted tin can lying on the hospital floor. She frowned. That's odd. Where did that come from? She murmured. She glanced left and right and spotted Jessica mopping not far from them. Oh, Jessica, would you mind picking up this can and throwing it away? I don't know where it came from. Must have dropped off a kitchen cart or something. I'll have to tell them to be more careful with their garbage. Jessica gave a silent nod and, dragging the mop, picked up the can and threw it in a nearby trash can. Thank you. Oh, and Jessica. Jessica slowly lifted her head, her hair parting to reveal her delicate features. Her eyes were dark. Didn't they used to be a brighter brown? Wondered Nurse Macy. 
is there like a Fazgu situation going on here? Is like, is this the fake Jessica, not to be mistaken by the real Jake? <laughs> uh, this is really, this is really weird. Uh, one small beauty mark was dotted high on her left lovely cheek, but her skin seemed to have lost some of the rosy flush it once had. Her lips were delicate and full. Her face was slim and so pretty. She could, she really could be featured in magazines. You're doing a good job for us. Nurse Maisie gave her a small smile. Jessica smiled, and it seemed to brighten her despondent features. I'm glad. Jessica spoke quietly, but the glad didn't reach her eyes. I bet you're a big help at home with your family. Do you help with cleaning around the house with your mum and dad? Nurse Maisie watched Jessica merely nod and turn away to continue mopping down the hall. I'm telling you, creepy, Colin said under his breath. Yeah, I agree. Nurse Macy, why is there such a loud car going past? Uh, Nurse Macy just waved her hand at him. <laughs> oh, sh oh, hush. She's just a young girl and you're a grown man. I think you could take her on if she attacked you. Colin shuddered. Don't be so sure. Even though Nurse Macy joked with Colin, she could admit to herself and not explain why. That peering into Jessica's dark gaze nearly broke her heart. On her break, Jessica walked into the hospital chapel. The room was full, was, oh sorry, was empty of grieving family members. She liked it that way, to have the chapel to herself. It was rare, but it was peaceful and quiet and it allowed her to pray. She ran her hand softly over the wooden pews that lined the walkway to the altar and chose the first seat. At the front of the room was a large wooden cross hanging on the wall. She smelled the fresh white flowers set out for display on both sides of the room. There were three rows of small candles waiting to be lit. Quiet instrumental music played through a wall speaker. She pulled the thick silver chain that hung around her neck from beneath her shirt and lifted it over her head, placing the pendant in her palm. The pendant had once been a whole heart, much thicker and, uh, and larger. Now it was slightly bigger than a crescent moon about the width of her thumb, with rough scratches embedded on one side. Nearly finished. That's a creepy line. She clasped her hands around the pendant and closed her eyes. Please help me do good and continue with my purpose. Please help me make a difference. Please help me help others who are sick. Give me the strength to right my wrongs. Give me the courage to do what's right. I said courage, I meant courage, because I only read the core and then, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> thank you. Hello, miss, are you doing okay? Jessica blinked and stopped praying. She hadn't heard anyone enter the chapel. She looked over to see the priest standing beside the pew. He wore a black suit with a white collar. His hair was dark with streaks of grey, and his eyebrows were thick over kind brown eyes. There were tiny lines beside his eyes when he smiled. I'm fine, she responded quietly. My name is Father Jeremiah. I've seen you here before. What's your name, miss? Love how we got another Jeremiah. <laughs> Jessica. Jessica cast her gaze down and rubbed her thumb across the pendant. Is there anything I can help you with, Jessica? Jessica shook her head. No, thank you. Father Jeremiah took a seat on the pew across from hers. You look pale, Jessica. Are you feeling okay? Is there something I can get for you? A snack? Some water? Should you be resting? I feel fine, I think. I probably look better when I'm working. Working? Here at the hospital, in the children's wing. I help keep the floors clean, to and fro, to and fro. Nurse Macy says I'm doing a good job, she added. She hoped she was doing a good job. This job had been the perfect opportunity to get closer to those who needed her help. It was rare for her to come across others who were sick in the outside world. She'd heard the car accident last night by chance, a miracle, some might call it. She'd heard the terrible screech of tyres, the harsh crash of the car against the tree. It had taken her time to get there through the heavy rain. She had watched the ambulance come and the EMTs try to save the boy. They hadn't been able to save him, but she had. Oh, so the girl was her and the pendant healed the boy. That makes sense, okay? I think... I might be getting that completely wrong, but that makes sense. She was glad she'd been there to help. She'd cut it close, though, and nearly been caught. She could never allow that to happen. Ah, yes. I know Nurse Macy, a very caring nurse. Father Jeremiah nodded. I'm sure you're doing a good job. He cleared his throat. You know, Jessica, 
Some people come here asking for help in their prayers, and I often listen to those who have burdens to release or healing to experience. Expressing our worries, our problems, helps us to let go of what is heavy on our minds and hearts. Jessica simply said, that's nice. She felt like she was already letting go, sorry, letting go of something very important in her own way. She never shared her thoughts with anyone because no one would be able to truly understand what she was going through. If you ever feel the need to talk to someone, I am here nearly every day to speak with, should you choose. I'm happy to help in any way I can. Jessica nodded her head, keeping her eyes downcast as she rubbed the pendant with her thumb. What is that lovely charm you have there? Must be very special to you. After a moment, Father Jeremiah said softly, Peace be with you, Jessica, and left her alone. After a few more moments of prayer, Jessica slipped the chain back over her head and rose from the pew. As per her usual routine, she went to one of the single hospital restrooms. She locked the door and walked to the small mirror above the sink. She inspected the dark circles under her eyes and the paleness of her delicate skin. Some might think she was lovely, but the truth was she looked frailer each day. This was my theory, I think. I think it was everyone's theory that the pendant may be... Like, like she may be scraping the pendant on the patients, um, which is like curing them, but I feel like it's going to make her become more frail, and so she is going to lose all of her energy, her life force. Being lovely was once all she had ever wanted. She could feel the weakness take over her body with each child she helped, with each scrape of the pendant. She wore a black sweatshirt and black pants, and even black sneakers. Black wasn't a welcoming colour, it kept people away from her. It helped her remember that she wasn't there to enjoy life, but had to stay focused on her purpose. Interesting, so this is her... She, she's like full on believing that this is her purpose. Not to live well, but to make others live well. I, I like, to help others. That's kind of cool. From her pant pocket, she re removed a compact powder. She opened the lid and patted the soft applicator to the powder and, drop, and dotted her face with the concealer. It was pretty soft ivory that gave her a fresher look. After she put the compact away, she pinched her cheekbones to give herself a little colour. Her eyelashes were naturally dark and thick and her lips full and pretty. When she used to smile, people would smile back at her and be interested in what she said. Jessica used to feel that certain things were important, like how she looked, the best clothes, the coolest friends, the cutest boys, but they actually weren't as important as she had once thought. Now everything was different, and she never smiled unless she had to. Interesting. Jessica left the bathroom to return to work. The lights were dimmed for the evening and the staff had quieted down. As she pulled the mop and rolling pail from the cleaning closet, she heard the faint sound of cartoons playing nearby. Setting her mop aside, Jessica followed the sound to a new patient's room. A little boy with brown hair was curled up on his side, asleep, holding a green stuffed elephant. He was alone. Jessica turned to glance behind her and saw no one looking in her direction. She walked quietly into the room and pulled her chain over her, her head, grasping the pendant. She slipped her knife out of her back pocket and opened the blade. If someone walked in, they'd think she was trying to hurt him. No, she would never dream about hurting anyone. She wanted to help him in a way only she could. She never told anyone about her purpose of helping those who were sick. Okay, now I'm really, really sorry, but this is the best quality we're going to get. Uh, so I, I do apologise about that, but I'll be reading it, so you don't really even have to look at the screen if you don't want to. Beside the bed of the little boy. Here we go. Jessica began scraping roughly at the pendant with her pocket knife. Little shavings of silver drifted down on the boy as he slept. As she scraped, the, her chest seemed to tighten. Her, sorry, her pulse slowed and her breathing became shallow. These feelings in her body were how she knew she was helping this little boy heal. When she felt it was enough, she slid the chain back over her head and, pendant, and the pendant once again under her shirt. Uh, closed the blade and put the pocket knife away. The little boy blinked his eyes open. Blue eyes gazed at her with interest. Are you an angel? He whispered. No, she whispered back. I'm no angel. Go back to sleep. But I'm not sleepy. Jessica's uh, uh, lips twitched. Your eyes look pretty sleepy to me. I think if you close your eyes and count sheep, you'll so you'll get the rest you'll need to make yourself strong. He scrunched up his nose. Sheep? Why sheep? Okay, what would you like to count then? 
I think I want to count elephants. I like green elephants. Okay, you can count elephants. Go ahead, close your eyes and count. The little boy closed his eyes as he said, One green elephant, two green elephants, three green elephants. Soon he drifted back to sleep. Jessica turned to leave and nearly stumbled as a wave of weakness washed over her. Something skittered across the floor. She held on to the doorframe and balanced herself as the faint, as the, the something feeling, faintening, frightening feeling. I don't know what this word is, I'm sorry. As the something feeling went away. She licked her dry lips and spotted a raised, a, a rusted spring just by the doorway. I'm so sorry that I can't read this properly. Uh, her eyes widened. She quickly uh, snatched up the spring and walked out of the room to finish her work for the evening. Jessica sat alone at a lab table in science and engineering class at West Wilson High School. Interesting. Engineering. It, uh, so, hang on, hang on, hang on, let's, let's just process this, right? There was a, there was a rusty spring. Huh. And she took it. So this is like, this is reminding me of Eleanor, Eleanor a lot, because we know this is the Eleanor pendant. Is Eleanor back? Did Eleanor take an old Jessica body and replace herself you know, you know, in like To Be Beautiful at the end when um, Eleanor like takes Sarah's body and runs away with it. Did she do the same to Jessica? And now, no, because it's Jessica's consciousness. And she's like, she still has memories and stuff. It's not Eleanor. <laughs> this is weird. I don't know what to think of this because there's like, there's still science and engineering class, which we're going to get onto. And there's like metal, there's scrap metal still. This is weird. This is weird. Jessica sat alone at the lab table in science and engineering class in West Wilson High School. She preferred sitting alone, but it always seemed to happen naturally. No one dared to sit next to the weird girl who barely spoke, who barely participated in their world. She felt tired and distant. Uh, yeah, okay. Mrs. Willoughby, is that, yeah, Mrs. Willoughby was droning it on, or droning on about a new project, and if she let herself, Jessica dr could drift off into another place in her mind away from this present reality. She wasn't sure why she continued to go to school. Maybe it was to keep up the presence. Uh, huh? <laughs> her old life was now far behind her. There really was nothing here for her other than she didn't want to make things difficult by drawing attention to herself by missing school or even getting bad grades. She really could do without the many secrets, oh sorry, the many scents of perfume, body color, and oh, body colour? That's weird. Body odour and junk food that surrounded her every day. The boring lectures, the teenage gossip, the stares from searchers and students. Sorry, teachers and students. Oh my gosh, this is so difficult to read. I'm sorry, this is all we've got. <laughs> but it's enough, I'm sure. Uh, and not to mention the overall loudness of school. Pounding feet, yelling voices, uh, slamming lockers, music playing, uh, cursing, crying and laughing. So much noise, so many constant reminders of kids her age who were natural with friends, or normal with friends. Teenage problems and families at home who loved them even if they didn't always remember to be grateful for them. Jessica had a home once. She'd had a family, she'd had everything, and one day she gave it all up by making the wrong choice. Oh, she made the wrong choice? If there was one thing Jessica had, um, had something in her life, it was that, or learnt in her life, sorry. It was that some choices couldn't be re reversed and the only thing to do was move forward the best that she could. Look, it's the creepy girl, a student whispered behind her. Someone giggled. She hardly speaks. What's the matter with her? Another girl wanted to know. She's like a mannequin who barely moves. Mark Johnson says she creeps around the graveyard. Oh my gosh, like a freaking zombie. Who would have thought West Wilson High would have its very own walking dead? Jessica didn't say a word. She'd heard it all before. Zombie girl. Mannequin. Dark witch. The walking undead. Although she did her best not to draw attention to herself, she still did. Just not the kind of attention she used to receive. She'd become the target of mean go gossip, teasing, and sometimes pranks. 
Overall, she was a loner, a girl who was often avoided as she walked school hallways or sat in the cafeteria at lunch, which served her just fine. The more she was avoided, the easier it was to check out the present high school reality. Um, there were a few more whispers from the girls before something small hit the back of her head and dropped to the floor. More laughs. Uh, cr cr something cracked. It, even some laughs from the surrounding students. Jessica's something, her hair down, with her... This is so difficult to read. With her hand, unbothered. Girls? Mrs. Willoughby scolded. Is there a problem? Mrs. Willoughby was on the younger side as a teacher. She wore dark rimmed glasses and often sported a black ponytail. Um, sported a black ponytail. She was one of those teachers who spoke with her hands and was eager for class participation. She seemed to leave Jessica alone though. One of the girls cleared her throat. No problem, Mrs. Willoughby. I would hope not. I think you girls would rather be out with your friends at lunch than helping me clean up the science lab today. No, we're good, Mrs. Willoughby. Thank you. You are so kind. Now may I continue without being r rudely interrupted? Yes, Mrs. Willoughby, the girls answered together. At the lab table next to her, a boy picked up the usual eraser that had bounced off Jessica's head. He tossed it back at the girls. Real mature, he muttered. What's his problem? The girl whispered, annoyed. He's new. He doesn't know the reality of Zombie Girl. Uh, Jessica glanced at the boy and then look, looked away. He was indeed new to the school. Okay, class, choose your partners, Mrs. Willoughby announced with a clap of her hands. Make sure to choose someone you know you can get to, uh, work accomplished with instead of someone to goof around with until the last minute. This will be 50% of your quarter grade, so make it good. Jessica blinked. Choose your partners? What did she miss? The new boy stood and came to her table. Hi, he said. Want to be partners on the project? Jessica swallowed hard. She supposed she had to. It wasn't like she'd get another offer. She nodded. He sat next to her in the empty chair. I'm Robert. Jessica. This project is going to be kind of cool, huh? Jessica slowly nodded, unsure what it was about. She hadn't been paying attention. Robert had an athletic build build with something hair, hazel eyes, and golden skin. He wore a pale blue coloured t-shirt and faded jeans. There was a something leather bracelet, bracelet? A leather bra bracelet? That can't be right, <laughs> on his right wrist. He was the kind of boy from whom she would have wanted attention in her old life. Now she wish she was invincible or invisible. Uh, I transferred from out the town, he continued. My dad is an engineer and got a new job here. He was excited about this t class for me. Robert pushed his hair back with his hand. Were you excited? Jessica flinched. What, what was she doing? She was supposed to keep to herself. Yeah, it's fun, you know, building stuff. But this will be my first time in a class like this. Jessica nodded. She'd used to think building stuff was fun too. These girls were acting dumb, he'd said you quietly, with a shrug of his shoulders. There were girls like that in my other school. I never hung out with them, just mean to everyone for no reason. They think it's cool. I guess when it's not. Doesn't bother me. He lifted his eyebrows. Really? That's cool. Most people wouldn't say that. Then he smiled. I can't believe we get to build our own mini robot. Jessica stared off in the distance. Oh, perfect. Uh, after school, Jessica was, uh, oh god, Jessica was something at, at a table in the, what does that say? Something at a table in the school courtyard waiting for Robert. They, they'd had a couple of class sessions to plan but the bot project and decided to make a mini rolling bot that carried items on its back and it was controlled with a remote. The catch was that they had to have the tray lift up and down. I, I don't think I'm reading this right, I'm so sorry. Robert had taken apart an old remote control car and discovered the components to make their bot active. Robert dropped a cardboard box on the table, causing Jessica to recoil. He pulled out his old remote control car. 
I asked Miss, Mrs. Willoughby how much we could use from, how much we can use from this on the bot. She gave me a list of what we can and can't use, Robert said, handing Jessica the paper. Today he wore a pale yellow shirt that buttoned up down the front with grey sweats. Jessica wore her typical all black outfit. Jessica took the list he handed her. We need to find other components for the ones we have to replace. Yeah, I know. What are you doing later? Mrs. Willoughby wants us to salvage as many components as we can instead of purchasing them. Maybe we can go to the junkyard and see what we find. Oh no. Oh no, it's the junkyard from To Be Beautiful. It definitely is. I swear to God. Jessica quickly blinked a few times. I know we need a couple of string, uh, springs, something to be used as a tray, maybe old wiring. I, I can't, she stumbled out. Why can't she? Huh? Robert looked at her with a slight frown. I can't go there. I, I have to work at the hospital. I, to work, I forgot. Robert shrugged. Oh, well, we can go another day. We have time. Maybe, oh, sorry. Uh, maybe she is an Eleanor victim, right? Could could she be a victim of Eleanor that we didn't see in Fazbear Frights? And she is actually made of scrap metal, but the pendant could be keeping her alive? I don't know, I, d I don't know. This is weird, this is very weird. Um. Oh, well, we can go another day. We have time. No, Jessica said a little too sternly. She could feel her insides begin to shake. She started to pack her notebook into her bag. I have to go. Robert stared at her with surprise. Now? I thought we were going to work on the project. We made a schedule. We should keep to it if we want to finish on time. Can't today. Tomorrow. You go to the junkyard, okay? It's not my thing. All right, it's for the project, you know? It's not like I, ha I like to hang out at junkyards either. Uh, are you okay? He grabbed Jessica's wrist, and Jessica pulled away as if stung. Are you... sorry. Are you sick or something? You look a little pale. I don't feel well. Do you want me to walk you home? It's not a problem. I can come with you. Maybe you shouldn't be by yourself. No, I don't need help, okay? I'll see you tomorrow. Wait, if she doesn't have a family, does she have a home? <laughs> that might be a stupid question, right? Or is she, like, living by herself? She grabbed her bag and quickly rushed from the table. She felt faint, as if she could just kneel over at any second. She managed to make it off school grounds and lean against a tree for support. She grabbed her pendant with a shaky hand and closed her eyes. Her breath filtered out of her mouth quickly. Everything is going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. After a few moments, Jessica managed to calm her breathing. She licked her dry lips as she settled down. She didn't know what had come over her. She'd learned to steady her emotions, or at least mask them from others. She couldn't let her emotions erupt like that again. It made her too vulnerable, and when she was vulnerable, she couldn't think straight. She set off toward the cemetery. The wind had picked up and was blowing her hair wildly. The cemetery had become her sanctuary in the few months. In the recent, in the recent months. A quiet, peaceful place. Is this her home? No way. Wait. Maybe, maybe them calling her zombie girl is actually, like, an actual thing. Why does she live in a cemetery? When she stepped into the cemetery, she often stopped to read the headstones to get familiar with the souls who had been laid to rest. She wondered about her own grave. Oh, oh, sorry. And what her stone would read. She doesn't have a grave yet. That would have been a weird story if she, like, visited her gr Or she lived in her grave. She actually was a zombie. Oh, man, that's a good theory. Could she actually be a zombie that's been revived using the power of the the pendant? But whenever she scrapes off the pendant, there's less power coming from that pendant, and so she's turning back into her dead self. That's such a weird premise for a story, and I like it. It was more than likely she would never get a burial. As she strolled through the graves, her mind drifted back to Robot. Uh, robot. Her mind drifted back to Robert. She hadn't... <laughs> she hadn't really met a boy so kind and confident before. If she let herself, she could start to like him. 
which was not possible now. Maybe in her old life she could have opened herself to having a true friendship, maybe something more. But that all changed the day she made a choice. And each day she was doing her best to make up for that choice. She had a purpose now and she was sticking to it. She made her way to the furthest and oldest of family crypts. Uh, there, hidden among the graves, was a small mausoleum made of stone with dark stained glass windows. Old, dried vines covered the top and hung down the sides of the structure, patched with white cobwebs. She gripped the rusted handle and leaned her foot on the bottom of the door, pushing with everything she had in her. The heavy door creaked open and scraped along the, do uh, along the floor. Dust particles twirled in the sunlight. She pulled out her small flashlight and stepped inside, and pushed the door closed until she was surrounded by the dark. She switched on the flashlight and walked to the back of the small enclosure, passing what she assumed were family, well, a family of dead people named Holloway, then turned around a corner to a small sitting area that was made of stone. She'd cleared all the cobwebs of as many spiders as she could manage in this little hideaway. The groundskeeper neglected this section of the cemetery since the graves were over a century old. She kneeled down on her sleeping bag and grabbed a pack of matches to light three yellow candles placed off to the side. She dropped her book bag and sat on the sleeping bag and pillow. Here she could let down her guard. No one, should, no one could see her. No one could judge her. No one could wonder about her at all. She was safe for now. Next to her she had a duffel bag of her signature black clothes, a small overnight kit with some makeup, a hairbrush, toothbrush and toil toiletries. She kept her life simple, minimal. She had one small item from her old life. She reached in the bag and took out a white rabbit's foot and let it dangle from her finger on the short chain. She used to carry it with her everywhere, thinking it brought her good luck. Now she didn't believe in good luck, but it was a small reminder of who she used to be and who she would never be again. She lay down on the sleeping bag and let herself rest. Jessica noticed Nurse Macy was humming under her breath at the nurse's station while she was performing her mopping duties. It was mindless, really. Mindless in a kind, a weird kind of way. Weird was the theme of her life these days. But what really concerned her was the fatigue that weighed down upon every inch of her body. Her grip on the mop was shaky, and even though she moved at a slow pace, she was tired. It was a bone-deep exhaustion that had been becoming more and more frequent each day. She used to have so much strength, and now she often wished for the time when the pendant had become a whole, when it had been a whole heart, and she'd been full of energy. It is draining her. The truth was, she'd been busy the last few nights with the patients. She lifted a shaky hand to the pendant that lay under her shirt. It was definitely smaller now, thinner. A tremor of fear vibrated down her spine. She lifted her chin. She could do this, she told herself. With as much strength as she could muster, she continued to push the mop. To and fro, to and fro. Hi, Jessica. It's a lovely day, isn't it? Nurse Macy mused, a wisp of a blonde curl shifting on her forehead as she walked over to her. Nurse Macy always wore scrubs in shades of orange, blue, green, or purple. Sometimes the patterns had funny characters or animal prints. Today they were cats making silly faces on her top. Her smile was welcoming. Uh, and even though Jessica did her best to keep her distance, Nurse Macy had this energy that pulled others toward her. Jessica nodded. You want to know why it's a lovely day? Nurse Macy asked. Jessica paused and looked at her expectedly. Most of our patients in this wing have improved in some way, she said with a bright smile. They're eating, even smiling. Most times there's a heavy sadness that you can feel around this floor, but now, today is a good day. When there are smiles and meals being eaten, um and pain has decreased. It's like magic. In my line of work, you have to take the wins when you can get them, Jessica. Do you remember that? Take the wins when you can get them. Jessica liked that. She'd remember that advice. Nurse Macy gazed into Jessica's eyes. How are you feeling today, Jessica? Jessica looked away. Good. That's nice. Anything new going on in your life? How's school? Jessica gripped tightly on the mop. Nothing new. Everything good. Glad to hear it. Well, Juicy calls. See you later, Gator. Jessica watched her wave off to uh, uh, to visit another patient. Even though she enjoyed being around Nurse Macy, it was getting harder to avoid her direct questions about her personal life. 
She suddenly saw the nurse come to a halt right in the middle of the floor. Sheesh, what's going on with all this junk, Jessica? There's an old fork on the floor. Would you mind cleaning it up? Between this and the weird flakes. Dang it, she missed another one. Okay, Jessica answered. Jessica slowly walked up, uh, walked to the old fork and picked it up. A fork? Really? She said quietly. Then she rolled her eyes and tossed it in the trash. That was when she noticed someone new. There was a teenage girl about her age. She was lying in bed, wearing headphones. She had red hair and tiny freckles speckled across her cheeks. She solemnly played with the phone in her hand. There were three empty jello cups on her side table. Jessica pushed her mop pail closer to the room and the girl noticed her. She pulled off her headphones. Hey, she said to Jessica. Hi, Jessica said. You work here? Jessica nodded. The girl frowned. Why would you want to spend your free time around sick kids? Because I want to help them. It's a job, she said instead. What's your name? The girl asked. Jessica. I'm April. I was admitted early this morning. I'm not handling my treatment well this time around. You probably see a lot of kids like me around here. Sometimes, she said. Doesn't it bother you being around this? She waved her arm around her. Jessica shook her head. Am I supposed to treat you differently? No, but a lot of people do. You don't know how many times I see looks of pity or sadness and sometimes fear. Like if they are near me long enough, they might get sick too. I don't see that in your eyes. They stared at each other for a few moments. Then Jessica said, got to get back to work. Okay, um, you should stop by sometime. I'll be here, unfortunately, eating lime jello. Jessica nodded as she pushed her pail away. I got some springs, wiring, some bolts, and metal slats. What do you think about this tray? It's an old one, but it's cool, right? Robert said to Jessica as they sat at a lab table in class. Just the right size for the mini-bot. Jessica sat quietly, looking at the items Robert had apparently salvaged from the junkyard. She wanted to knock all of the dirty junk off the table, but instead she sat still like a statue, unmovable, emotionless, as if the sight of the old garbage didn't bother her at all. You're not saying much, Robert said to her. Jessica met his eyes, saw the curiosity, and looked away. Yes, these will work fine. It's great. After the other day, I thought maybe I'd done something wrong. Maybe you didn't want to be partners anymore. He shrugged. It's kind of late to find new partners. No, I told you that I wasn't feeling well. She unclenched her fists and pointed to the tray. This is just the right size. You did a good job. I know, right? Robert pushed his hair back with his hand. I got excited when I found it. This bot is going to be so cool, Jess. You just wait and see. Jessica froze as she heard the old nickname that her closest friends had once called her. She felt a lump form in her throat and she swallowed hard. She hadn't known how difficult it would be to interact more at school and with Robert on this project. It was taking so much willpower to keep her in her seat and not run from it all. Reminding her of her past and bringing more of it into the present was not what she wanted. Mrs. Willoughby strolled by their table with their notebook to mark off their progress. Nice, Robert and Jessica. You are both pulling together your components on time. I like your initiative. She looked over the blueprints they had put together. Looks like your bot is coming together. Good job, you two. Let's see you start the build over the next few days and make some progress. Okay, Robert said with a smile. Jessica nodded. How do you feel about the project, Jessica? Mrs. Willoughby asked her directly. Jessica bulked. Mrs. Willoughby usually avoided speaking with her. Um, I feel good. It's going to be good, she replied awkwardly. How do you like working with Robert? Jessica glanced at Robert and then back to the pieces on the table. Good, she mumbled. He's a good partner. So is Jessica, Robert piped in. She's worked really hard helping me, helping me with the design and keeping us on track. I'm glad we're all good then. Mrs. Willoughby said with a small smile. I'll check back with you in a couple of days about your progress. Keep up the hard work. Mrs. Willoughby walked to the next table and Jessica could feel her shoulders relax. Robert rubbed his hands together, excitement lit in his eyes. Let's get started, Jess. Jessica watched Robert set out a few components for the structure of the minibot. She was very aware that she hadn't yet moved to help. He'd set out four metal slats that they would connect for the framing of the uh, of, so that they would connect for the framing of the mini bot three of the metal pieces were obviously old and from the junkyard one piece looked fresh and newly purchased go on 
pick one up, she told herself, but she couldn't bring herself to move past her hesitation. The used parts were dirty and old, and stunk of rust and grease. They reminded her of things she'd rather forget, but she knew that she couldn't avoid this forever. She couldn't just have Robert do all the work on the minibot. That wouldn't be fair. Detachment was her greatest offence. Sometimes she envisioned her feelings as if she was a possum. When a possum felt it was in danger or threatened, it froze into a catatonic state. Jessica imagined her feelings being just like that. When she was strong, she could manage to shut down her inner feelings until the threat was over. Right now, she was the possum. Her aversion to this junk did not affect her. In fact, she was very much frozen inside until the threat to her feelings had passed. She slowly reached for the dirty metal slats. She felt the cold steel in her grip, and she brought it toward her. She stared at it as she turned it over and examined the rusted edges. She could touch anything from the junkyard and be okay. It would not harm her or affect her feelings. She set it back down and rubbed her fingers against her pant leg and ex exhaled a deep breath. Success. Ooh. <laughs> How mysterious. Nurse Macy was checking on Billy's vitals. Colour had come back to his cheeks and his appetite had increased, which in turn gave him more energy. You're doing so well, Billy, she told him. You're eating all of your meals like a big boy and taking your medicine. I am a big boy, he declared as, a zoom, uh, as, a zoomed, as he zoomed a toy aeroplane over her arm. Yes, you are. Hey, Nurse Macy, when will I get to see the angel again? Angel? Nurse Macy asked, with curiosity. Yeah, the angel who helped me feel better. Oh yeah? How did the angel make you feel better? She came to me in the night, and then I felt better. I'm not sure how she did it. She must have used magic. I like her. I want to see her again. Wow, that's pretty cool. You must have a guardian angel looking over you, Billy. Billy lifted his little fists up in the triumph. Yay, I have a guardian angel! As he shifted... Tiny specks fluttered on his blanket. Nurse Macy spotted the flakes of silver with dismay. What was this stuff? She quickly brushed them off Billy's blanket. Yes, you are a lucky boy. I'll check on you later and bring you some pudding. How does that sound? Yum. Chocolate, please. You got it, she said. I'll be back in a bit. Just then, there was a loud clang from outside Billy's room. Nurse Macy started. What in the world? She walked out of the room, and in the centre of the hallway she found... a piece of a car muffler? Frustration coursed through her. This is getting ridiculous. Who is playing these pranks? She spotted Jessica nearby, mopping. Jessica, did you see someone drop this? Jessica's eyes widened. Um, no. I didn't see anyone else in the hallway. Well, somebody thinks they are funny, and they're not, she said a little loud so the culprit would hear. So they'd better stop. Please, Jessica, grab some gloves and throw this garbage out. I'm going to try... I'm trying to keep a clean floor here. If I get a surprise visit from the higher-ups and they find this garbage around, we'll be in big trouble. Jessica nodded and hurried to the janitor's closet. Nurse Macy frowned. She'd called and checked with the nurses on the other floors and no one else was seeing junk left around in their areas. It was just in the children's wing for some reason. She decided to take a walk around the floor to see if she could spot any more tricks happening around the patient's rooms. She turned down a corridor, and sure enough, she found a couple of greasy bolts. Disgusting. Nurse Macy gritted her teeth. Once she found out who was doing this, she was going to give them a good scolding on how dangerous it is to leave industrial objects on the floor for someone to trip over. Not to mention how unsanitary it was for her sick patients in the hospital. She might even turn them over to hospital security to give them a good scare. She slipped on the rubber gloves that were stuffed in her pocket and picked up the bolts and continued on until she found a small rusted can. She swiped that up, but she, didn't, she still didn't see anyone around. Then she found herself right in front of the hospital chapel. Uh, was the culprit inside? She wondered. She dumped the junk in a nearby trash bin along with the dirty gloves and stepped inside to peaceful music. There was an old woman sitting in the centre of the pews, but Nurse Macy couldn't imagine that she was the prankster. <laughs> Get it? Prankster because Father Jeremiah? Anyway, she stepped further in and walked to the front of the pews, 
looking around for anyone who might be suspicious. Hello, Father Jeremiah said from behind her. I think Jeremiah is rather sus. Uh, <laughs> it's just, it's like kind of comedic timing where it's like looking around for anyone who might be suspicious. Jeremiah just pops in behind her. Nurse Macy jumped and put her hand to her chest as she turned. Hello, Father, she said quietly. Sorry, didn't see you. He lifted his thick eyebrows. How are you today, Nurse Macy? I am doing well, Father. How are you? I am well. Coming in for a visit? She began to nod, and then her face heated from the fib. Well, I am looking for someone who has been playing pranks around the children's floor, leaving pieces of garbage around. Nothing serious, I hope. It could be, so I need to put a stop to it, but I can't seem to figure out who it is yet. I'm sure you'll discover your truth soon enough. She nodded. I hope so. Father, by the way, there's a young girl named April on our floor. It would be nice if you could visit her and put her in your prayers. She could use some cheering up. Thank you for telling me. I will do that. How is our friend Jessica doing? Nurse Macy smiled. Oh, you know Jessica? She's doing okay, I think. She does a good job for us. He frowned. I worry about her. So frail. So quiet. I've been praying for her lately. She visits here often. That's nice, Father. I worry about her too. She could use a friend, I think. Nurse Macy nodded. I think so. Father Jeremiah smiled. Well, peace be with you, Nurse Macy. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Father. Same to you. I hope you discover your prankster. Just remember to go easy on whoever it is. Everyone has a story that we don't yet know. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yes, Father, I'll remember that. Father Jeremiah is so sus right now. Nurse Macy sighed and started to return to work when her foot knocked against something. She bent down to pick it up. She narrowed her eyes as the discovery. at the discovery. It was a rusty lock. There's just so much trash around this hospital wall. This is crazy. Jessica sat on a chair in Robert's dad's workshop as Robert soldered some wires into the minibot. The workshop was pretty neat, she thought. Shelves with labelled boxes lined one wall. There was a work table that sat against the opposite wall, and another work table in the centre that Robert was working on. She stood on the other side of the table wearing goggles. She had felt hesitant having this next meeting at his house. It was too close, too personal. But Jessica knew that they had to work together to get the minibot completed and the next step had to be soldering the minibot's guts together and the arm that made the tray go up and down. Robert turned off the soldering tool and lifted his goggles. I think I've got it. You know, Jess, we really need to agree on the name for the minibot. She lifted her goggles to her forehead. I like calling it minibot. Even though Jessica hadn't intended to be funny, Robert chuckled. Minibot? The MB, huh? The M to the B to the M M M M M to the B? Yes, we could just give it a number, like the Minibot 5000. Robert made a face. Not very original. Robots aren't always original. Sometimes they're just made from boring old junkyard scraps. A heavy sadness suddenly came over Jessica as she clenched her fists. She'd really thought she'd gotten over the sadness and pain of her predicament and had set, uh, settled on an overall uh, acceptance. But lately, emotions and feelings had been coming back at the weirdest moments. Why now? What had changed? It's not always about where things started from, Jess. It's about what you have, what you make of all the pieces once you have them. Scott Cawthon reference. Jessica frowned. My dad told me once, and it always stuck with me. Remember, he's an engineer. He's always creating something out of pieces. Knock, knock, said uh, Robert's mum as she entered the workshop. Sorry, that was very monotone. Knock, knock, said Robert's mum as she entered the workshop holding a tray with a plate of brownies and two glasses of milk. I thought you hard-working engineers could use some body fuel. She had honey blonde hair, just like Robert, but she was shorter and her face softer. Jessica noticed that they had the same welcoming smile. His mum set the tray on the workside table. Thanks, mum, Robert said. Jessica thought she should say something too. Yes, thank you. I hope you like brownies and milk, Jessica. Do you have any allergies? No, I don't. <laughs> Good. Enjoy them, she said. I look forward to seeing your finished mini bod. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Robert's mum left, 
and Robert grabbed the tray and brought it to their table. He set it down, grabbed a brownie and took a bite. These are the best, he said with a mouthful. My mum is an awesome baker. Try one. Jessica was hesitant to, to take one. She watched Robert chew his brownie, then gulp down some milk. The truth was, she used to love brownies. They were her favourite dessert. But she never treated herself anymore, never allowed herself to enjoy sweets or anything that connected her to her old life. She believed she didn't deserve them anymore. Come on, you know you want one, Robert said to her. This is strange. Uh, the reason I say it's strange is because I feel like this could maybe relate to patient 46. You know how patient 46, like, the, the, doesn't take the, the candy and stuff and doesn't like flowers and stuff, but... Vanessa does, and they seem to be the same person, but different. I honestly think that patient 46 is Vanny, but, like, this is very interesting on how she feels like she doesn't deserve it, you know? Maybe patient 46 is, well, I say innocent, but, like, kind of, like, innocent at heart, but kind of changed ways or something. I don't know. Something to think about, maybe. Uh, I'm going to be theorising through the whole read-through anyway, so... Jessica tilted her head to the side. I guess I can have one. Are you not supposed to eat sugar or something? Um, not really. Jessica reached for a brownie. She could already smell the cocoa and the butter. She took a small bite and closed her eyes. The brownie tasted heavenly. Oh my gosh, that's really good, she murmured, enjoying the sweet treat. I told you, the best. Baking is one of my mum's favourite hobbies. Um, you know, Jess, Robert said. You haven't told me much about yourself or about your family. What do your parents do? Jessica blinked. You never asked. Well, and I'm not much into sharing. She interrupted in order to sidestep the conversation about family and took another wonderful bite. He smiled. Like I couldn't tell. You're not like other girls. I know. I'm not trying to be conceited. I just know that I'm different. Weird. I wouldn't call you weird. I mean, other girls I've met like to talk about themselves. Sometimes too much. Worry about a lot of drama. You handle things differently, quietly. It's nice. Jessica didn't know what to say. Anyway, he continued on, then, con then cleared his throat. You know, I'm new here and I don't have any friends, yes? You heard about the prom coming up. She nodded. I'm not a junior. I am. Jessica met his eyes, and Robert seemed to blush. He brushed a nervous hand across his hair. I wondered if you would like to go with me. What? To the prom. I thought it would be fun to go together. Jessica stared at him in shock, her brownie half eaten in her hand. She was actually speechless. She'd worked so hard to separate herself from school, from others, to be as invisible as she could make herself. And now she'd met a new boy, who strangely didn't think she was weird, and wanted to take her to the prom like a normal teenager. It's in a week, he said, quickly, to fill the silence. Do you think you'll have to work? Maybe you can request it off. Um, his cheeks reddened. I mean, if you want to go with me, unless you were already asked. Who would ask Zombie Girl? No one's asked me. Robert smiled. Then what do you say, Jess? Would you like to go with me? That night, Jessica rushed to the hospital chapel. Her heart was beating fast. For the first time in a while, her goal was skewered as if she couldn't see the finish line anymore, and it didn't feel good at all. She sat down on the first pew and stared off into space. She didn't know what to do. She had left Roberts, or Roberts awkwardly telling him she had to find out if she could get the night off. She had let him know, and she'd come straight to the chapel for guidance. She pulled the pendant over her head and clenched it in her hands, closing her eyes. Please help me know what to do. Please guide me. I never thought this would happen. I had made a plan, and now things have changed. I did my best to keep to myself and to do the right thing, and now everything seems to be falling apart. Should I pray with you, Jessica? Father Jeremiah asked from beside her. Jessica swallowed. I don't know. I mean, if you want. Father Jeremiah sat next to her. For a few moments, they sat in silence. I don't know what to do. Jessica finally spoke to Father Jeremiah as she stared down at her pendant. I always believed this pendant gave me strength, so that when I worked around the sick children, I could give them a piece of it to help them too. I had thought I had found this job for that reason, to help others, to redeem myself for the bad choice I'd made in the past. But now things are changing, 
and I find myself wondering if it's okay to give my to to, to give to myself again by having some of my own life back, something normal. I'm not sure if it's okay though, and the worst part is that I had been so certain that I was on the right path. Why do you feel like you can't just give to yourself, Jessica? Because of the past. A tremor radiated through her body. The past. The past. The horrible past. I... I just didn't make the right choice. I mean, that's how I got where I am. I gave up everything, so there had to be a good reason for that, right? And now I'm asking for just a little piece back. Not something so big, really. Just a little thing for myself. Is it too wrong to ask? Jessica looked down at her pendant. It was so slim now. Barely anything left. Was she too late to ask for something in return? Did she even deserve to ask? Why didn't she have an answer? Of course not. When we do work for others, we have to be open to receiving as well. If we overgive, we become out of balance and we can make ourselves ill or sad. Giving to others is a great gift. But yes, Jessica, giving back to ourselves is a gift as well. God loves all of his children and he wants everyone to feel happiness and love. Jessica looked at him directly in the eyes for the first time. Is that really true? How do you know? Father Jeremiah lifted his eyebrows. Because I know it in my heart to be true. He's so sus, man. <laughs> Father Jeremiah watched Jessica slowly stand and leave. Her head bent down in sadness. Poor child, he thought. He wished he could be more of help to her, but he knew from experience that he couldn't save everyone. Oh, that's interesting. He knew from experience he couldn't save everyone? Has he killed people? <laughs> he could only do his best to guide them. He began to rise when he looked down at the floor and found a metal circle with spikes on the edges. He picked it up, studying the object. Some kind of gear, it seemed. That's odd, he thought. He frowned and glanced at the door Jessica had just exited. Jessica walked back to the children's floor. The lights were lowered for the evening. She could hear the beeps of machines and oxygen blowing air. Most of the kids were asleep. However, April was still awake. Come in here, Jessica. I see you. April called to her. Jessica tried not to be noticed. She wasn't doing such a good job of that lately. She stepped into April's room. Hi. Where's your mop? April wanted to know. Still in the cleaning closet. There was a beat of silence between them. It's cancer in the blood, if you are wondering why I'm here, April told her. There were dark circles under her eyes, like the ones Jessica had covered up with her makeup. I'll be losing my hair again soon. Bold would be the new me. Jessica didn't respond. You're pretty, April said, studying her. Tell me about your school, your life. I've been in and out of school for the past couple of years. Missed out on a lot of my stuff. My friends barely speak to me now. They don't know what to say. They think I don't want to hear how much fun they're having, but I do. I used to play basketball. I'm athletic, or used to be. What I wouldn't give to run down a court and shoot baskets again. But now I can just do that in my imagination. So you tell me, please, just for a few minutes, help me be part of your world. Jessica grabbed her pendant hanging from her neck and rolled it back and forth on the chain. She knew she really didn't have a life, not the one she really wanted. But if embellishing a little about how wonderful her life was would help April, then she would try to talk about herself. Leaning against the wall, Jessica told her about Robert and the minibot. She told her how nice and kind he was to her when others hadn't been, that the project was halfway complete, complete and that he just asked her to the prom. April listened with a smile and a few questions thrown in, with swoons over Robert and the possibility of going to the prom. Maybe one day, I'll get to go to the prom, April said. I can dream, right? You will go to the prom, Jessica said, if you believe it. I can picture it. I would be completely healed. My hair would be full and healthy. I think I would have a bright pink dress or a green one with matching shoes. I would go with a nice boy like your friend Robert. I would dance all night and laugh with friends. Maybe even be part of the royal prom court. Then we would all go out together somewhere, like the beach. We'd run around a small campfire and talk about our dreams. The stars and moon will shine down on us. And maybe the boy would give me his coat because I was cold. And then it was quiet and we were alone. He would give me a kiss under the stars. It would be the best night of my life. This is kind of um, 
reminiscent of the real Jake, where like Jake was, obviously Jake obviously also had cancer, and he was like thinking of who, what he would do if he didn't, you know, uh, the real Jake. Uh, yeah, that I like I like that. It's kind of like a, well, not really a parallel, but very nice. Uh, Jessica pictured the scene along with April, but instead of April, it was Jessica having the best night of her of her life at prom. Jessica felt herself yearn for a wonderful and normal experience, just like April had described. I'm tired now. April lowered herself on the pillow and closed her eyes. We'll talk again sometime, Jessica. Okay. Jessica clenched the pendant as she looked at April. She could help April, she thought. But was she supposed to help everyone? Father Jeremiah's words drifted into her head. Giving to others is a great gift, but yes, Jessica, giving back to ourselves is a gift as well. With guilt heavy on her shoulders, Jessica quietly drifted back into the dark hallway. After school, Jessica and Robert were ready for a first test run with the minibot. Robert wanted a quiet place so other students wouldn't bother them. Jessica suggested the cemetery. The day was sunny and the cemetery was fairly empty of visitors. You were right, it is pretty quiet here, Robert said as he looked around. Yes, almost peaceful, Jessica said as she led him to a far empty section of a parking lot. How'd you end up finding this place? he asked. Jessica blinked. Um, well, his eyes widened. Oh, do you know someone buried here? Jeez, I'm sorry. Oh, no, never mind, she said, not having an explanation that he would understand. Let's just get set up. The small bot was melded together with various metal parts from the junkyard, and the remaining components brought to the hardware store with a flat tray on its back. The arm had been fused together with an aluminium tubing, with the wires tucked inside. It was not yet painted or officially named, but it was ready for a trial run. Robert set the mini bot down and then placed the soda can on the back of its tray. Okay, Jess, this is our first test run for the mini bot 5000, Robert announced. Jessica's eyes widened. You named it after my choice? I thought you said it wasn't original enough. Yeah, but it's the best name we have, and MB deserves one. So, Minibot 5000 it is. Are you ready to take some notes? <laughs> Lately being with Robert and experiencing his kindness, Jessica felt an unfamiliar warmth inside of her when she spent time with him and when he made nice gestures to her like choosing her name for the Minibot. She couldn't really remember feeling this way before. Or maybe it had been so long that she'd forgotten. She wasn't sure if that was wrong or right, but she knew she enjoyed feeling good. She nodded. Notebook. Check. Okay. Switching on the Minibot 5000. Turning on the remote. Here goes nothing. Robert pushed the knob on the controller forward. There was a pause. Then the Minibot shifted an inch forward and started rolling. Yes! It's working! Robert shouted. Jessica smiled as excitement for creating something new rushed over her. We actually did it! Okay, here goes the ultimate test. Robert pushed a button on the remote and the tray rose slightly. Then he switched the button again and the tray shifted back down. All right, he said with excitement. The lift works! Robert directed the Minibot 5000 to turn right and then left, then back around to stop in front of Robert's feet right before a wheel surprisingly fell off. The Minibot 5000 fell to one side. The soda can tipped over and fell to the ground. They stared at the wheel as it rolled off to the side. Then they laughed. We can fix that, he said, and smiled at Jessica. We succeeded with our first run of the Minibot 5000. We make a good team partner. Jessica nodded. Yes, she took a deep breath. And Robert. Yeah, something fluttered in her stomach. I would like to go to the prom you. Robert's smile got bigger. You would? Awesome, he said. I'll get the tickets tomorrow at lunch. I can meet you at your house before the dance. Um, no, I can meet you there. It'll be easier for me. Are you sure? Yes. Oh, okay. We can go eat afterward if you want. I don't know all the good places to eat yet, but maybe you can tell me your favourite. Maybe. Just let me know what the colour of your dress will be as soon as you know. So then I can try and max match the tux if possible. Depends on what's available at the rental. What a sweetheart. <laughs> Colour of the dress? Oh, okay. Alright, great, Jess. It would be fun. You want to do the honours and get this wheel back on the Minibot 5000? He offered her the socket wrench. Jessica gave a small smile and took the wrench. Sure. 
Nurse Macy watched Jessica mopping the floor. Something was definitely off. Jessica stared into space, barely moving. Usually her head was down, as the girl was doing her best not to be noticed, and today it was like she was in a trance. Nurse Macy recalled what Father Jeremiah had said. She could use a friend, I think. Jessica, are you okay? Nurse Macy asked her. Do you need a break? How about some water? You could be dehydrated. Jessica blinked. No, I'm okay. Are you sure? Jessica nodded. If you need help with anything, please don't hesitate to ask. Jessica stared at her a moment, and Nurse Macy began to feel like Jessica would forget to speak when she finally blinked. I'm going to the prom, she said. Nurse Macy smiled, happily surprised. That's wonderful! Who's the lucky boy? His name is Robert. He's my science partner. I bet you're excited. Jessica didn't answer. Is there something else bothering you? Nurse Macy asked her. She wished she knew what was going on in her mind. I've never been to the prom before. I don't know what to expect. And I don't know what to do about a dress. Nurse Macy looked at Jessica with compassion. She wanted to ask her, what about her mum or dad? Or a sibling or a relative? But she felt those personal questions might shut down Jessica completely at this vulnerable moment. She didn't know Jessica's personal story, but she understood Jessica was fragile and secretive about her life. There appeared to be a sadness about her that never seemed to go away. In Nurse Macy's experience, deep trauma usually was the cause of that in the kids she cared for. Nurse Macy always had this drive within her to help others, especially caring for the young. Even though Jessica wasn't a patient, she could tell the girl needed her help. Do you need some assistance in that area? She asked her softly. Jessica stared down at the floor for a moment. Then Nurse Macy watched her, her nod, her head up and down. It was very hard for Jessica to ask for help, and Nurse Macy felt a glow in her chest that she trusted her enough to ask. I'm happy for you, Jessica. I have an hour-long lunch break soon. We can go right to the department store, and I'll give you some advice on a dress. How does that sound? That would be good. I'll grab you when it's time. Jessica stood in a slim, ankle-length lilac dress in front of a mirror in the fitting area of a department store. There were pale flowers etched into the design. The material was soft on her skin and beneath her fingers as she brushed her hand down her hip. She couldn't recall feeling a dress so soft before. She'd tried on a few before this one. There had been so many colours of dresses. Pink, white, blue, yellow, red and black. Short dresses and long ones, off the shoulder or with thin or thick straps. Puffy skirts or straight ones. Dresses that glittered or shined. She'd wanted to wear black, but Nurse Macy convinced her to try something with colour. Jessica hadn't looked at the price tag, but she hardly used the money she got from the job at the hospital, so she had plenty of savings to buy the dress and some shoes. Jessica, you look stunning, Nurse Macy said in her gleeful way. Jessica really looked at herself. She lost a lot more weight recently, but she was still pretty, with her high cheekbones and full lips. Her hair was still thick and shiny. Her shoulders and arms looked delicate in the dress. In the mirror, she saw her lips curve, and for just a moment she could believe she was a regular girl buying a dress to go to the prom with a boy she liked, and who liked her back. That her life was normal and perfect. I think I like it, she said with a small smile. I do too. Let's get you some shoes to match. Deep down, Jessica knew this was like a fairy tale, and everything could burst and go back to the way things were soon enough. She'd asked Father Jeremiah if this was okay to allow herself to have something for herself, and he seemed to think it was okay. To her, Father Jeremiah represented life and death and forgiveness. He had to know what was right and what was wrong, right? Because now Jessica felt uncertain and fragile. Feelings she didn't feel comfortable with at all. Nurse Macy brought her over a matching pair of simple purple shoes. What do you think? Jessica slipped them on, and her weight and her height went up two inches. They fit. Not only do they fit, but they are perfect. You're going to look beautiful on prom night, Jessica, and you're going to have such a wonderful time. Can you walk okay? Jessica tried to walk and felt a little clumsy. Oof, it's not as easy as it looks. I've seen lots of women he wear heels, but they walk so naturally. Nurse Macy giggled. They were once like you. With some practice, you'll get the hang of it in no time. Just know it's normal for your feet to feel a little sore, especially after dancing. Don't ask me why we wear these things and torture ourselves, but they make our feet look pretty, don't you think? They do. Jessica glanced at Nurse Macy in the mirror as she gave her tips on how to walk confidently. 
Nurse Macy had always been kind to her, just as she was kind to all her patients. When other people at the hospital avoided Jessica, Nurse Macy always tried to talk to her, and now she was here helping her when Jessica m most needed it. Once upon a time in her old life, Jessica may have considered her a true friend, and had she been a normal girl, she very much would have wanted to be a nurse, just like Nurse Macy, someone she admired for her positive attitude and the way she cared for her patients. Bringing joy to others who were ill truly was a gift just like the kind Father Jeremiah talked about. I bet your family will love the dress you've picked out, Nurse Macy said, searching Jessica's gaze in the mirror. Um, Jessica said as she tried to think of a response. She, she supposed a typical parent would have loved seeing their daughter in a pretty prom dress, but that wasn't the case for Jessica. She tried to think of something to say, but her mind went blank. A sales lady walked by them in the fitting room and stopped. Wow, your daughter looks gorgeous. Is this for a prom? Jessica and Nurse Macy locked eyes in the mirror, and Jessica had no idea how to respond. She simply looked down at her shoes, her hair shielding her face. She does, doesn't she? Nurse Macy suddenly said. Yes, it is for prom, and this is the perfect dress. We will definitely take the dress and the shoes. Jessica raised her head and blinked in astonishment. She didn't question why Nurse Macy didn't correct the sales lady about her being her mum. She guessed it didn't really matter. Explanations took too much energy sometimes. It was better just to let others see what they wanted to see. As Jessica continued to look at herself, uh, she, <laughs> she let hope spread inside her for the first time in a long time. Prom night was going to be perfect. After her shift, Nurse Macy wanted a nice hot meal while watching one of her favourite TV shows. She vowed she would get that soon enough. It had been about a week since she'd taken Jessica to buy her prom dress, and she'd been wearing, her with, wearing with herself about what she should do. Should she leave well enough alone and let Jessica's business be, or should she take action to help her? She'd finally decided to take action. Nurse Macy rechecked the copy of Jessica's work application that she'd submitted to the hospital and tried not to let the guilt get to her for invading the young girl's privacy or violating high... Uh, I don't know why I started saying high. H-I-P-A-A. Hippa. She read Jessica's address and put it into her phone's GPS app to guide her to Jessica's home. Oh my gosh. <laughs> She felt she was doing this in Jessica's best interest by getting down to the truth of the teen's family life. Nurse Macy felt if she knew what was going on at home, then she would be able to help her. Maybe speak to her parents or her guardian, explain her worries about Jessica's health and demeanour. Perhaps even let them know that Jessica needed some help emotionally. Jessica was a wonderful girl. She deserved family support for things like prom. She deserved someone to care about her. She deserved to be happy. Nurse Macy knew Jessica was hiding something about her home life, but she wasn't sure what it could be. Yes, she had a habit of sticking her nose where it didn't belong, but that was what made her a good darn nurse. A oh, darn good nurse, sorry. Uh, she investigated the, the facts to, help, to better help her patients, and with Jessica it was no different. When Nurse Macy saw someone in need, she reached out to help. Especially when the poor girl had to ask her co-worker to help her get a dress for prom. Where was her mother or father, or her guardian? Why wouldn't a 14-year-old have someone to turn to? It was so sad, and she just couldn't stand it. A few minutes later, she drove down an older section of town. Some of the street lights were burnt out, and she could see many of the homes were run down. There were a couple of boarded-up windows with graffiti sprayed across garage doors. Turn right on Cemetery Lane. Oh, sorry, I have to, I have to do it in the voice. Turn right in Cemetery Lane. That's not the voice, whatever. Her apparatus to her. Uh, <laughs> Nurse Macy turned right. The night was clear and the stars shined above the town. She drove past the cemetery and looking at the dark gravestones felt a shiver cool down her back. The poor girl lives near the cemetery, she realised. Down the end of the road was the last dilapidated house on the block. Your destination is on your left. Nurse Macy pulled along the sidewalk and parked her car. She got out and clicked her car fob to lock her doors. She took a deep breath and pulled her coat closer around her neck against the cold of that evening. She would simply explain to Jessica and her family that she was worried about her and wanted to make sure she was okay. Then she would ask to speak to her guardian alone and explain her worries. She didn't want to embarrass Jessica at all. 
She walked up the cracked walkway to the door. The light was dim, and she could see the light on the inside through the curtains. The paint was chipping off the house and door. Nurse Macy knocked. She heard a little dog bark and footsteps before the door swung open. An old woman with glasses stood in the doorway. She had curlers in her hair and no teeth. Nurse Macy could tell by the way her lips were pursed. Her skin was wrinkled and pale. She wore an old ripped robe, the colour of grey storm clouds. Yes? Not yes? <laughs> the old woman said as she squinted at Nurse Macy through the thick glasses. Hello, my name is Nurse Macy. Nurse? Don't need no checkup. Had one just the other day. Shush up, Pipsy. <laughs> the old woman said to the little barking dog. Oh, Pipsy. Oh, no, I work with Jessica. Are you her grandmother? Nurse Macy could understand deeply, clearly, why Jessica didn't have the support she needed. If she was living with her grandmother, she likely had to take care of this woman rather than the other way around. Who did you say? Don't have my hearing aid in. Can't hear as good as I used to. Nurse Macy leaned in closer. Jessica, is she here? May I speak with you about Jessica? Jessica? I don't know no Jessica. Nurse Macy blinked in confusion. She stepped back to look at the house number. Um, is this 333 Cemetery Lane? Yes, but you have the wrong house. No Jessica here. Now I need to get back to my shows. Don't want to buy nothing either. Oh, well, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. The door was shut in her face. And then the porch light turned off. <laughs> Nurse Macy sighed in frustration. Where in the world are you, Jessica? Jessica was in total darkness. Her surroundings were completely quiet except for her breath. There was a coldness that penetrated her skin, straight to her bones, and she shivered. She touched her bare arms, then and then her clothes. She felt the material of her prom dress. Why am I wearing my prom dress? She wondered. Where was she? She put her hands out in front of her, trying to feel her way forward, but she saw nothing in front of her and nothing behind her. Fear crashed over her. She was nowhere. Had she died in her sleep? Was this what the afterlife was like? Was she in some kind of in-between world? But she couldn't have died, she realized. It wasn't yet her time. She still had to go to the prom. She still had to help April. She felt the dependent and gripped the metal that always felt warm to the touch. It was still around her neck. She started to walk around with slow, hesitant steps. She didn't know how long she walked. It seemed like forever. Out of nowhere, she finally heard a creak. A footstep? A movement? Hello? She whispered. Is someone there? Please. If you're there, pl say something. I'm afraid. I can't see anything. Please. I don't know what to do. No answer. She licked her dry lips as she continued to move forward, trying to get somewhere. Anywhere. Was there a wall? A door, maybe. Another sound came from around her. Metal creaking against metal. Jessica froze as awareness dawned. No. The sound happened again, but this time right behind her. A shudder of terror radiated down her spine. Jessica ran. She rushed, to she rushed forward as fast as she could, with her arms waving around her wondering if she would collide with something. Metal footsteps stomped behind her. Quickly, too quickly. So close, so close. She blinked, trying to adjust to the dark, but she still could not see anything. In the cold, a sweat broke out on her body as she ran, trying to escape the terrifying things that chased her. A tense grip curled around her arm. Jessica screamed. No, please, get away from me. Someone help me. Quickly, the grip tore off her arm from her shoulder. Oh my gosh, that's gruesome. She felt the warm gush of blood rush down the side of her body. Her body vibrated in shock. Her mouth opened, gasping for air. Then she felt a grip on her other arm. Jessica tried to yank away when she felt her arm pulled from her bone. Jessica fell down in pain and agony, and it seemed like it took forever to collide with the hard, cold ground. She heard more creaks and movement of metal around her, above her, sorry. And then she felt something cold grab the pendant on her neck before it was torn away from her. No, don't take my pendant away. Jessica jerked awake with a frightening scream. She was in her sleeping bag on the stone floor in the mausoleum. She pushed against the stone bench at her back and grabbed her mini flashlight, flicking it on. Her heart felt like it would pound through her skin. She swiveled the light around, looking for anything in the night. 
She listened for sounds of metal creaking against metal, but she could only hear her breaths filtering out of her mouth and crickets chirping in the night. <clears throat> she saw nothing around her but stone walls. She was truly alone. She touched the pendant against her chest as she calmed down. She was safe. Everything's okay, she said aloud, and waited for dawn. When the soft rays of light peered through the coloured glass window, Jessica looked around her dark and stale surroundings. Since staying in the mausoleum, for the first time she saw it for what it really was, a cold, dark place for the dead, not for someone alive, not for someone who wanted to live. The next day, during science and engineering class, it was time to present the Minibot 5000 to Mrs Willoughby in the class. Jessica sat next to Robert at their lab table. The Minibot 5000 was sitting on the table between them. They'd painted some of the parts, Robert's favourite colour, blue, Jessica held the final written report in her hands to be turned in with the presentation. She felt nervous, which was odd for her. She noticed Robert bouncing his leg up and down. He seemed nervous too. They tested out the Minibot 5000 a few more times and everything had generally worked, but as they learned throughout the project, anything could go wrong at any time. During their other test runs, the Minibot 5000 had burned out a wire, which had to be replaced. Springs had broken and needed to be fixed. And now the final presentation was here, for better or for worse. Jessica wanted Robert to feel better. She took something out of her book bag and held it in her hand while they listened to the other students' presentation. When the class clapped, she poked Robert in the shoulder. He glanced at her. Here, she said, and opened her palm. It was her lucky rabbit's foot. He lifted his eyebrows. A rabbit's foot? It's for luck. I know we'll do well, but it might, take, it might make you feel better to have a little extra luck on your side. He smiled as he took the rabbit's foot. That's cool. Thanks, Jess. He dangled the short chain that, was attached to, that he, it was attached to on his finger, as she had done many times before. Jessica smiled back. You're welcome. I have something for you, too. He loosened the braided leather band on his wrist and handed it to her. I'd like for you to have this. She shook her head. But it's yours. You always wear it. Now I'd like you to have it. Jessica, looked, uh, Jessica took the bracelet and slipped it on her wrist and tightened the band till it fit. She felt a funny warmth in her chest. Thank you, she said quietly. I can't wait for tonight. Prom's going to be fun. Jessica felt a nervous flutter in her stomach as she thought of prom. Robert and Jessica, you're next. You're there. Yeah, you're next. You're next. Sans. Uh... Robert stood, sliding the rabbit's foot in his pocket. Look, it's Ken and Zombie Barbie. <laughs> I want to say that better, hang on. <clears throat> Look, it's Ken and Zombie Barbie, the girl <laughs> behind them said, and a few laughs followed. Robert ignored them, and Jessica smiled that he didn't let, him, that let them get under his skin. Um, oh, right, yeah. He lifted the Minibot 5000 and they made their, their way to the front of the class. It took 15 minutes to discuss their entire plan for Minibot 5000. The design, the components, the building of the bot, and the trials and tribulations that followed with the, with the test runs. And now let's see Minibot 5000 in action, Robert announced. Surprisingly, Robert handed the controller to Jessica to perform the Minibot 5000 presentation to the class. Then, all eyes would be on her alone. She nearly didn't take it. She was used to being invisible, to being looked over and forgotten. Robert gave her a reassuring smile. You can do it, he whispered. With a trembling hand, she took, she took the controller. She flicked on a switch on the Minibot 5000 and then the remote. Robert grabbed the soda can and went to the other end of the presentation floor. She pushed the knob to move the bot forward toward Robert. Minibot 5000 sputtered at first as usual, then moved toward him. She stopped it right at his feet then flicked the button so that the tray elevated. Robert placed the can on the tray, and Jessica flicked the button so that the tray went back down. The can wobbled, but stayed upright. She then backed it up and turned the Minibot 5000 around. She guided it to Mrs Willoughby and raised the tray for her teacher to grab the soda. Well, thank you, Minibot 5000. I don't mind if I do, Mrs Willoughby said. She lifted the soda, cracked open the tab, and took a sip. Yummy. The students laughed. A successful mini-bot, you two. Great job. She praised their work as the class clapped along. Robert smiled, and even though all eyes were on Jessica, she didn't care. She smiled back at him. 
As they sat back in their seats, a girl came up to Jessica and Robert's table. Jessica automatically ducked her head, her hair sliding against her face. Hi, the girl said to Jessica. I'm Tina. Jessica lifted her head and blinked in, and blinked in surprise. Oh, hi. The girl had brown hair pulled back into a ponytail. She wore a black sweatshirt and faded jeans. Jessica noticed her in class a few times. She kept to herself and was often studying alone. Your pot is really cool, Tina said. Thank you. Um, I liked yours too. The moving arm, right? Yeah, thanks. I paired up with Blake. He's okay. Maybe next time we can work together. Jessica glanced toward uh, Robert, but he was talking to another student. Yeah, maybe we can, she said. Okay, see you around, Jessica. Okay, bye, Tina. Jessica couldn't believe it. Another student actually wanted to speak with her and possibly work with her on a project in the future. She was used to kids avoiding her, and now another student wanted to be around her. She swallowed, trying to wrap her mind around how quickly things were changing. If only it was that easy. And she was afraid she was starting to like the changes. Oh no. After school, Jessica walked by April's hospital room. The girl was asleep. Prom was soon, but she'd wanted to come in and see how April was doing. Maybe talk to F Father Jeremiah again. She passed by the nurse's station where she overheard Na Nurse Macy talking to Colin, the nervous nursing assistant. April has a very high fever and we've tried different antibiotics to bring it down. For some reason, nothing's working, Nurse Macy said, clearly frustrated. That sucks, Colin said. She's a sweet girl, talks with me and asks me so many questions just about my life. Darn it, I feel helpless when the medicines that are supposed to work don't help at all. It's frustrating. I want to help these children, not just comfort them. Jessica gripped the pendant and wondered if she was doing the right thing by going to prom instead of helping April. Seeing April lying in bed, pale and fragile, when she had the chance to make her better, seemed so wrong. She had to be perfectly sure she was making the right choice. Oh, Jessica, Nurse Macy said when she noticed her. Jessica stepped forward. Yes? I wanted to talk to you about something important. Jessica blinked. Um, okay. It's prom night, right? Jessica nodded. I want you to have lots of fun. F uh, fun? Fun. Nurse Macy's face blushed. Um, and well, I, I tried to go by your home last night to check in on you, but there's an error on your home address you have listed with the hospital. Is it an old address? Jessica's, uh, Jessica blinked rapidly. Oh no. Suddenly an alert went off in, Jess in April's room. Nurse Macy jerked her attention away. Call the doctor! She shouted to Carlin. Carlin, Carlin, uh, as she rushed to April's room with two other nurses. Jessica watched in dismay as Nurse Macy checked the, med the machines connected to April. She demanded something of the other nurses, and Jessica watched them put a vial of medicine into April's IV. Soon, April's alert turned off. Jessica felt a pressure in her chest. Taking a breath, she hurried to the chapel to see Father Jeremiah. April was not doing well. The prom was tonight. Her dream was still heavy on her mind. What did it all mean? Was she making the wrong choice? Was she being too selfish? Was she avoiding her destiny? Everything was too much. The pressure to help others. The uncertainty of what to do. She just couldn't handle it. When she got to the chapel, Father Jeremiah was speaking to a man who was crying. Father Jeremiah was whispering to him with a hand on his shoulder. Jessica walked to the first pew and sat down. She took off her pendant and held it in her hands. Please help me understand if I am doing the right thing. I've made the wrong choices before. Could you send me a sign, please, to show me what I need to do? I feel like I just can't do this anymore. Please, I need guidance. But no sign came to her. No answer popped into her head. Jessica felt so alone. It was the same feeling she had felt when she knew she had changed forever. She had vowed to herself. She would never feel this way again. But it was like she was back to where she had started. Jessica needed to get ready for prom, but she had another important question to ask Father Jeremiah. She glanced at him and saw that he was still talking with the grieving man. She wanted to know if there really was an afterlife. It didn't look like she would ever get her answer now. She left the chapel and hoped she was doing the right thing by giving herself some of her life back. 
prom night had arrived. Whoop whoop! Jessica's stomach was in knots as she walked into the prom with Robert by her side. Music seemed to bounce off the walls. Kids were chatting and laughing, dressed in pretty dresses and dark tuxedos. The dance floor looked full and there were still more kids seated at tables. There was a corner set up to take pictures and long tables lined with snacks and drinks. Chaperones were off to the side, watching the kids dance. Robert had given her a corsage, a pretty white rose with baby's breath, tied with a purple ribbon. Luckily, Nurse Macy had told her about the whole boutonniere thing. I don't know what that is. Or she wouldn't have had one for him. Hang on a second. <coughs> oh. God. That was nice. Uh, some of the kids who made fun of her stared at her, and Jessica hesitated. They likely hadn't expected Zombie Girl to go to the prom, let alone have a date. They were probably waiting for her to do something crazy, like attack them with vampire fangs or something. No, she wouldn't break out in fangs, but she might just fall on her face. Between getting little sleep, doing all the work for the presentation, and the excitement of getting ready for prom, Jessica was exhausted. She'd gotten ready at the mausoleum instead of the hospital like she'd planned, afraid to run into Nurse Macy again and have to answer questions about where she lived. Jessica had no idea what she would tell the woman. She never really had to lie about her life because usually people stayed away from her. In a candlelight with a small hand mirror, she had to put extra layers of makeup on her face to cover her shallow skin and the dark circles under her eyes. She'd put on some tinted eyeshadow and she left her long hair down. Her nerves were practically shot, but she was determined to enjoy every minute of this prom experience. Deep within, she felt this could be her last chance to experience something very special. You look ve- Let me start that again. You look really pretty, Jess, Robert told her. She glanced at him and smiled as they walked further into the room. Thank you. You look really nice too. He wore a nicely fitted black tux with a light purple vest. The white rose boutonniere was pinned to his suit jacket. Want to dance first, or get something to drink? Robert asked. Jessica looked around, wondering what to do first. She wanted to soak up every part of the experience. Let's dance first. All right. Robert led her to the dance floor. They squished in between couples as a slow beat began to play through the speakers. Robert put his hands around her waist, and she put her hands on his strong shoulders. He smelled of a faint cologne that he must have worn just for the dance. She realised things had changed for her the moment she met Robert. Over the last few weeks, he had slowly gotten close to her and helped her open up to him and to some of the experiences she never thought she would have again, such as making friends, being more present in her life, even something as simple as indulging in her favourite dessert. She'd thought the only way to fulfil her purpose was to keep her distance from others, she thought she deserved to be alone for her past mistakes. But no matter how she tried to stay away from others, it hadn't worked. She'd gotten to know Nurse Macy, Robert, and now she was even making new friends like Tina. And here she was, actually at prom. She couldn't believe this was happening. Something good. Something special. For her. Maybe even though she had made mistakes in the past, she could be forgiven and be deserving of more in life. Maybe Father Jeremiah was right about being open to receiving happiness and even love. Jessica and Robert swayed back and forth to the slow music. It was beautiful, really, even being packed in with so many kids. She could feel herself start to sweat from all the heat surrounding her. It didn't matter, though. This was a night she would always remember, so she could replay this night over and over and over in her mind as many times as she wanted. Jessica? Jessica looked up into Robert's eyes. It was like time stood still. He leaned down to her ear to speak over the loud music. Jessica, I want you to know that I really like you. Getting to know you these past few weeks has been special. When I moved here, I thought it would be the same boring experience at my other school. But when I met you, you were different. You made me feel different. He leaned back and smiled at her. She leaned toward his ear. I like you too, Robert. You've helped me come out of my shell a little more. I was used to keeping it to myself. I don't have a lot of friends, but you've been a good friend to me. He smiled as she leaned back. I'm glad I could help, and I'm happy you came to prom with me. Me too. A moment passed as they looked at each other. 
Then Robert leaned down toward her. He was going to kiss her. Oh my, she had never kissed a boy before. Her stomach fluttered. She felt sweat drip down from the side of her face. Robert's cheek glided against the dampness on her face. She felt his lips brush against hers. Robert staggered back. What is that? He brushed his hand across his face and Jessica froze. There was a dark grease on Robert's face, on his lips. She stood frozen in horror. Grease that was old, slick and dirty. And it was from her. Oh no, no, no. Something inside her cracked, as if she had been carrying within her this delicate cup of hope and dreams and happiness. And now the cup broke, spilling out all that she ever wanted. I, I'm sorry, she gushed out, frantic. Let me help. She reached out at Robert, trying to help him. He jerked away. Ugh, filthy, he spat out. He swiped at his mouth, spit on the floor. Filthy. Jessica stepped back and knocked into someone. Watch it, a girl snapped then looked at her, and her eyes widened. Oh my gosh, this was it, she thought. This was the sign she'd been waiting for. Kids stopped dancing to stare at her. Some pointed at her. Others made faces of disgust. The girls from science class were laughing at her. She'd made the wrong choice again. She shouldn't have come. A wave of heavy darkness engulfed her. Sounds faded in and out of her ears. Robert, the dance, the students, the decorations. Everything drifted away as if it never existed. And that was how it was supposed to be. This world wasn't for her. It was for someone else who deserved it. She could feel herself turning, running, as tears streamed down her face. The blaring music disappeared. The cold night surrounded her. And all she could do was run. Run far, far away. Nurse Macy was going over her patient charts at the nurse's station. She was worried about April's health. She was afraid there was no hope for the young girl. Mixed in with her worry about her patient was her worry about Jessica. She hadn't gotten a chance to talk further about the girl's address, but she wasn't going to let it go. When Jessica returned to work tomorrow, she'd sit her down and really ask about her family. No more excuses. She just hoped Jessica was having the time of her life at prom. Colin walked up to her. April is not improving. Her pulse is thready. Her vitals are weak. Fever is still high. Nurse Macy sighed. I know. She's the only one who hasn't made any improvement. It's not good. I just called Father Jeremiah to come and say some prayers on her behalf. It couldn't hurt. I'm open to any miracle for that young girl. I'll update her doctor right away. Suddenly, the hospital door swung open with a loud commotion. Nurse Macy and Colin turned their heads toward the door. Colin sucked in air. What the heck? Jessica? <laughs> Nurse Macy called out in confusion. Jessica looked terrible. Her face was pale. Brownish liquid streaked down her face from her forehead, eyes and nose. The liquid had dripped down her neck onto her beautiful dress, which they had bought not too long ago. Jessica looked wild, crazed. Nurse Macy stepped forward to ask her what had happened, but stopped in shock as Jessica ran past her. A few nuts and bolts littered behind her, scattering. They were followed by an old wrench and a rusty bike pedal that fell to the floor. Nurse Macy's eyes widened as Jessica ran into April's room. We need security, Colin said from behind Nurse Macy. Then Jessica slammed the door shut. Nurse Macy and Colin scrambled toward the door. It's jammed, Colin spat out, struggling to turn the handle. Nurse Macy hit the door with her palm. Jessica, open the door. Talk to me, please. Through the glass of the hospital room, she watched Jessica pull the necklace from over her head. It was the pendant she'd always seen her wear. Then she somehow had a knife. Jessica! Jessica began to whittle away at the charm above April's bed. Hurry, get this door open, Nurse Macy called out to Colin and to a security guard that had run over to help. I am, but she blocked the door with something, the security guard said. Nurse Macy pounded on the glass. Jessica, please, open the door. I need to see April, whatever happened. It's going to be okay. I can help you. What's going on? Nurse Macy turned to see Father Jeremiah. It's Jessica. She locked herself in April's room. We can't get in. Maybe I can help. Just then, the security guard and Colin were able to push the door open, sliding whatever was blocking the door. Thank goodness. Nurse Macy rushed in. She spotted April was asleep in the bed. But where was Jessica? Oh, gross, Colin said, pointing to the floor. How did all that get in here? 
There on the floor beside April's bed was a pile of metal pieces, steel bars, gears, bolts, and junkyard garbage. Smelly grease dripped from the pile as if it were blood. What is going on here? Nurse Macy whispered. Could she have gone out the window? Colin asked. He looked out the window, but found it locked. The security guard checked the restroom. Nurse Macy shook her head, bewildered, as she turned toward the door. Father Jeremiah? Jessica's gone. Just vanished. I don't understand. She was... she was just here. Father Jeremiah stepped into the room. He looked down at the pile of metal with a quiet sadness, as if he understood something no one else could. Then he made the sign of the cross and began to pray. In that moment, Nurse Macy heard April's heart monitor level out. Oh, sorry. And Nurse Macy heard April's heart monitor level out into a strong, healthy rhythm. I love it so much. Such a good story. Oh my god. That was so good. That was so good. That is easily, like, honestly, just easily my favorite story ever. It's so good. It's so, so well put together. Um, one of my favorite scenes, if you couldn't tell, like, by the way I was voice acting it, was the prom scene. Love that scene so much. Just, like, they are so, like, sentimental to each other. Jessica's, like, letting herself go. And then all of a sudden, it, it, everything just changed. The entire world just changed. It's kind of like that one time in Into the Pit, when Oswald was, like, going in the bull pit, to, expecting to, like, meet his friends again, but just went in the bull pit and uh, came out to hear screams and stuff. Like, it was that sort of moment. I love this story so much. Uh, I am going to be making a theory video on this and, like, a whole explained video so that I can explain it in more detail if you didn't completely understand everything that was happening here. Um... But I'll do a kind of like a quick kind of explanation, I guess. I personally believe, actually, I'm going to save that for the explanation video. But uh, clearly, the, the pendant was keeping um, like Jessica alive or something. Um, and when the pendant was, was completely used up, it, Jessica's time is gone. Um, and she, she did it. She, she had a final like... God, I hate to be in this world. And then she scraped the, the pendant on the uh, on April and revived her or made her feel better. It's like such a crazy story. Obviously, a lot of connections to To Be Beautiful here. It's literally... I, I'm not going to say it's the same premise because it's a completely different premise, but they both tend to metal. Uh, and so... And there are Eleanor connections. I have to say it. I have to say it. But this was such a good story. I could talk for hours about this story. Honestly, I'm not going to. Uh, again, I'm going to be making other videos on this story. So uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And I will see you in another audiobook. Goodbye. <laughs>